Welcome everybody. If you're you're here yet, we're going to give uh, this just another 30 seconds or so to let people catch up and get in and open the right browser and click on the right microphone. You are at the Boston Blockchain Association's uh, presentation this evening called Chained Together, How Blockchain is Improving Supply Chains. I personally think supply chain is literally everything that we do in our entire lives. So let's see how the this group uh, handles uh, what a supply chain is and how, how far reaching it is. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share a couple of slides that get us started. And then we're going to get back to these wonderful faces that you see in front of you now. So without further ado, my name is David Cutler, and I'm hoping you can see my screen. And we're going to be talking to Leanne, Kristen, Andy, and Andrea in just a minute now. But uh, before we do that, let's take a look at what Boston Blockchain Association actually is. We're a community of innovators collaborators and entrepreneurs excited about the promise of blockchain technology and that's why you're here we are building boston into the global hub of blockchain so if you're sending anything out to your network please use boston blockchain or hashtag boston blockchain we have a three-point mission unifying the boston blockchain ecosystem to one support educate promote and advance blockchain technology Two, establish Greater Boston as an international hub for blockchain innovation. And three, support and connect entrepreneurs with useful resources, very much like this presentation now. So join us, share this link, bring your friends and family, your parents who don't have an idea what you're doing, send them to bostonblockchainassociation.com. So we are working with wonderful companies who are more than just our, our sponsors. They're actually your potential partners. Uh, they are answers to your problems. They are uh, inspirers. So please support these companies. You're going to see them presented throughout these presentations. Um, Algorand, Bankprov, Pure Stake, Bloomy, Media Shower, Cardano Foundation, Deloitte, a new member, Rogers Bernstein, Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. Uh, this is a growing list that you're invited to participate in. And if you have any questions about getting introductions to any of them, please let us know. We'd be happy to do so. A couple of quick things going on next Tuesday. We have the Gateway to Blockchain Entrepreneurship Summer School coming up. If you want to get involved with that, it's already kind of started, but Tuesday it's kicking off. Please reach out to anyone at BBA to find out more about it. It's for students um, and the ecosystem there. We have a annual, first annual blockchain talent survey, and we will put this survey link. It's only a 10 minute survey. If you fill out uh, the survey, you get access to it. So please look for that in the chat as well. Again, it's only about 10 minutes to fill out. Uh, lastly, at the end of uh, the presentation, we're going to have a breakout session, uh, five different rooms. You will see in the chat the specific links to these, and you can choose any one you want, um, and that will end the event. But look for those links uh, in about uh, just under an hour, um, uh, maybe about 45 minutes from now. So that's who we are. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce Andrea. Uh, so to take over the rest of the event. So let's see. There you go. Here we are. Carry on. Perfect. Thank you so much, David. Um, let me introduce myself briefly. Uh, my name is Andrea Frusinini. I live and work in Italy, Florence, uh, to be more precise. I'm the current chairperson for Hyperledger Trade Finance Special Interest Group. And recently I also joined the Canadian Blockchain Supply Chain Association through a friend of mine. Uh, I'm a, let's say, former trade finance manager who has been lent recently to a more high tech space and blockchain, of course. Um, I would love to leave the word right now to the speakers uh, to have a self-presentation 
Uh, we're going to have, you know, Andy Lien. We're going to have uh, Christine Michaud. We're going to have Lien Camp. I'll let them introduce themselves. Who wants to start? Take the word. Christine. I can go, I can go first. I'm uh, Kristen Michaud. I work for a company called LiquidX. Um, we are a fintech that's been around for about four years. Um, I came over about a year ago to build out a blockchain solution that digitizes and automates the supply chain. Uh, we do inventory finance. We automate the purchase order, the invoice, and then we have a monetization platform where you can trade um, and finance those assets. So where you can insure them. Uh, prior to coming over to the FinTech, I spent 20 years in corporate treasury and financial systems roles across General Electric and IBM. So a big transition from kind of your traditional corporate space into a financial technology firm. Thank you, Christine. Hi hey everyone, my name's Leanne Kemp and I'm the founder and CEO of Everledger. We began in 2015 uh, purposing towards transparent and really open supply chains. Um, it built a blockchain technology combined with series other um, technologies to be able to bring transparency to the diamond industry. So we tracked diamonds from the source of the mine right the way through to the retail network and extended our capabilities into coloured gemstones like emeralds and rubies and sapphires. and we also do a fair bit of work in the fashion and luxury goods space with big brands like Alexander McQueen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hi. Liam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, Andy Lian. I'm actually in Singapore right now. Um, so I, I, I'm actually advisory board member to Hyundai DAC. Uh, more recently, I'm being appointed by the uh, Mongolian uh, productivity organization as their chief digital advisor. So I started my journey in the uh, you know supply chain space uh, roughly around 2015, and then they converted them into um, a blockchain supply chain the company in 2017. So nice meeting everyone. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, I would love to start this this meeting right away. Um, we heard so much talking about blockchain in so many uh, fields, in so many areas. Uh, we're talking about today's supply chain, and I would love to know from each of you, of course, uh, uh, what are the benefits that you know blockchain brings to supply chain uh, from two perspectives, basically from corporation companies and governments. Uh, I would love to have a perspective on these two uh, sides. Andy, are you going to start? Sure, no problem, no problem. So um, actually in the last uh, two years itself, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a lot of advice to government uh, on blockchain and uh, blockchain and crypto matters. Um, the last appointment that I had was, uh, you know, advisory for a uh, intergovernmental organization like UN, UN-like. Uh, I give advice to 22 countries. And then subsequently, when I step down, I'm still giving uh, advice to uh, South Korea, Moldova, uh, Mongolia, and so forth. So I realized uh, one of the key topics um, that, that, that comes out very frequently is not about, you know, cryptocurrency, about money, you know, how to have regulations around it but it's a supply chain, right? So the government side, you know, they want to see how they can implement or add an, an additional layer to their current system uh, to track, trace, and, and also monitor some of their, their, their food supply, for example, during this COVID period. So I, I, see, I see that um, most of us, you know, or at least from the government's side, uh, they are looking at the, the traceability uh, element you know, and I've met a lot of other uh, supply chain solutions provider. Um, some of them are from China, some of them are from uh, America and so forth. You know, they provide very, very good and streamlined solution um, that, that, that helps um, not only the governments, but also the smaller uh, businesses to adopt blockchain on the supply chain level. Maybe, you know, the simplest one would be, you know, warehouse management, for example, 
or some some sort of uh, tracking of their of their uh, of, of their deliveries and so forth. I've I've seen that hap happening, you know, in uh, South Korea, in China, and and that that is really making a, a lot of difference actually in in the space. The governments are very uh, proactive, you know, in terms of uh, supply chain management using blockchain technology, and um, by by having them to embrace, you know, the technology. You know, uh, a lot of other smaller technology provider actually came together and provided more solution. You know, um, if you look at Singapore, for example, you know, there are instances, you know, and, and there are companies out there that were actually uh, being supported by the government with a sufficient amount of grant. And all these companies are, are doing very well. You know, I, I personally uh, invested in one of them, you know, which is into the uh, supply chain, medical supply kind of uh, uh, business. Uh, they are right now using uh, blockchain technology to track and trace their products, track and trace the expiry date, the origins and so forth. So I think, um, you know, government are supportive, uh, corporations, you know, because of this COVID period, they are all stuck. They are trying to adopt new technology as well. I think right now, apart from you know the the, the really bad uh, COVID nineteen uh, virus, uh, in terms of technology adoption, uh, I believe it, it is at its highest right now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Andy. Uh, you mentioned a few things. Uh, uh, you mentioned traceability and tracking. Um, it is a very important issue and uh, I would love to have Leanne's perspective in this respect. You know, she's manager of Everledger and I want to, would love to have his opinion into this. I mean, uh, we, in my opinion, have to make clear what we mean by tracing, tracking uh, and what are the advantages of giving full visibility to the whole supply chain. Yeah, look, I, I think I might just say blockchain alone will not solve for physical supply chains. Technologies must come together with a symphony of technologies to enable the identity of an item and the traceability of that good. We're fortunate in the diamond industry because diamonds are unique by their very nature. So they're like a snowflake and we can create a digital twin of that diamond through various affordable scanning technologies. Um, Certainly there are layers to the supply chain as well. Um, one layer, of course, would just be the trade documents, whether it be invoices or bills of lading. And those two and those transactional based trade documents are um, giving some insight into the traceability elements across the supply chain. But Everledger works at the actual object level. And we think that traceability is critically important to financial services. Part of our work has been to not only think about supply chain trust from perspective of KYC, know your customer, but KYO, know your object. Um, and linking those two together gives an entirely new different set of risk parameters upon which you can make decisions um, across the supply chain. Um, the diamond industry is hyper consolidated. Ten major mining companies in the world. 90% uh, of the world's diamonds are cut and polished in one geographical location. A major certificate laboratory identifies about 80% of the world's stones. And so it's hyper consolidated. Very different environment to traceability for coloured gemstones, which of course are artisanal small scale producers, uh, of which there's only one or two major producers. So very different environments exist for various supply chains. Um, but the fundamentals of how you bring about transparency resides in the object identity itself. And sometimes you have to get to a forensic level, the ability to create a digital twin of that object and its identity, as well as then layering in the trade and the trade documentation across the supply chain itself. Uh, thanks, Leanne. Uh, you mentioned a few things, very important things. I mean, digital twins uh, and documentation. Um, what about, I mean, all of these aspects in international trade uh, are very important topics. Uh, how all these uh, issues impact on the financial side, of course, of the supply chain? 
So, and the I mean, from, yeah, from a diamond perspective, we certainly had the very early tremors of concern in the financial space. Um, there were major banks that have banked the industry for quite some time, but we found that there were also a significant amount of fraud that was running across the supply chain. And in 2018, it, I guess it was a domino effect that then came into existence um, with about $1.8 billion in supply chain fraud that occurred and a number of the banks have now pulled out of industry. Um, the ability to bring together both the level of an object and the identity of that stone um, so that there can be caveated interest there can be the ability to claw back. Um, none of that existed because it was predicated on a chit of paper and a promise to pay and a gentleman's handshake. And that only goes so far these days. Okay. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the physical maybe uh, aspects of the supply chain. We'll also have maybe have the perspective on the financial side by Christine. How did blockchain impact it? Uh, the financial aspects in supply chain and supply chain financing. Christine. Yeah, so very similar to what Andy and Leanne said is, um, you know, in specifically in the corporate and financial space, we're looking for traceability of the asset, right? So connecting the object with physical documents. And so maybe just to step back, you think about kind of the, you know, working capital process of a big corporate, um, they may not be passing diamonds. I'm super jealous of what the I get to work on. Um, but what they are passing is tracking inventory, tracking parts, pulling together parts um, into a manufacturing site. So you think about kind of inventory finance and how they're tracking parts. The um, funders are funding these suppliers to actually have enough inventory to produce parts that eventually comes and gets manufactured into an end product, right? And so there's risk associated to that. Leanne touched on one of those, which is fraud, right? So does that inventory actually sit in the warehouse, right? A lot of times the inventory doesn't sit with the supplier or could sit in a third party. So how do you track that inventory? How do you assess that inventory? How do you make sure it's sitting there? How do you ingest? A lot of times these reports are like manual reports you have to scrape and ingest back into the system. And so what blockchain doesn't do is it's not this magic wand that solves world hunger, but what it does is it provides that traceability of the asset, right? It allows shared visibility to that asset. So in that example, whether it's the funder, right, the financial institution, the asset manager, the customer, or the buyer, and the supplier, the warehouse provider, it connects them and gives them shared visibility to that footprint of the asset as it moves through this very complicated manual intensive process, right? And all that blockchain solution is supported with a ton of workflow, right? And so, you know, a lot of times just actually digitizing assets to get them onto the blockchain is an enormous amount of work for corporates, banks, you know, suppliers, customers, but that traceability and the benefits that they get across is what's valuable. Uh, thank you, Liam. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, one very important thing you pointed out. Uh, what about, you know, I deal with trade finance, with digital trade finance actually right now, which closely matches, you know, supply chain. Um, and one of the things that I ask frequently is how blockchain can help uh, device and new products. We all know that both supply chain finance and trade finance being so similar to each other. How can they help device and new products? I mean, for international trade. Yeah, I think you're taking, at least from my perspective, I'll, I'll add in and then yeah. others can feel free to respond. You're taking traditionally non-liquid assets and making them tradable, right? So traditionally physical assets you're transforming into a digital form and blockchain is enabling and making that actually um, able to be financed, service, visible across, which is really creating a new instrument in the financial market, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we sometimes, you know, we, uh, I mean, I'm talking from my perspective. Uh, so I've been 
trying to convey the message, you know, of having some new products, some new standards that are native on the DLTs and blockchain space. Um, we talked briefly about, you know, the opportunities uh, and trying to, to give a new uh, perspective on the opportunities that are brought by the blockchain to supply chain. Uh, once, you know, presented briefly the, the opportunities, I would love to understand from each of you what are on the other side the main challenges around blockchain within the supply chain space. Andy, want you want to start with by giving your insights into the main challenges? Um, I think, I, think one, I think one of the one of the main issue, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, supply chain and blockchain is that, you know, people, people, people and organization, they really think too, too, too big about blockchain. You know, they, 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 they think that the blockchain can, can literally track everything. You know, they could authenticate anything. You could prevent fraud and so forth. But, but the true fact is whenever there are human being involved in any part of the supply chain, there are possibility of human error fraud and a lot of other uh, possible scenarios that come out of it. So I, I would love to emphasize on the fact, you know, that, you know, in order for a blockchain supply chain system to work, traceability, transparency to work better, you need to have your own set of SOPs. You need to have your, your, your current company properly digitized, right? If you are all, you know, if you are not ready for that, then I think, you know, blockchain technology is, is, is not suitable for you, you know. So in some of the, um, in some of the uh, keynote speeches that I gave, you know, about, you know, how, how or why should companies use blockchain, it clearly states that if there is a need for it, then you go for it. If you're unclear about, you know, what blockchain can do for you, my advice always is to, you know, sit back and just, and, and just wait for some of these ready solutions to go to you, you know. So, um, you know, I think uh, Chris, Christine mentioned about the fraud and so forth, um, you know, prevent fraud and so forth. I think in, in the diamond industry, uh, for, for example, I think that, that, is, that is okay because there's a, it's a very unique uh, uh, environment. You know, but if you're talking about supply chain for, uh, for example, FMCG goods, uh, about uh, maybe perishable food, food supply and so forth, I think, you know, the, the kind of traceability and tracking, um, you know, might, might be a problem, you know, for, 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 for many of these uh, producers as well, you know. So I will end off my comments by saying that, uh, you know, blockchain can actually reduce uh, the, the, the percentage, you know, maybe reduce another 20%, you know, in terms of uh, fraud prevention, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the ability to trace. But, but it is not always a foolproof model, you know, for, for everyone uh, thinking that, you know, blockchain can really change the world, you know. Well, uh, absolutely, Andy. Uh, uh, one of the things that I'm often told is that blockchain is going to change the world. Um, uh, the answer I give often is it won't change the world. It will simply make it, you know, a little better than it is now. Uh, talking about the fraud, uh, we're talking about traceability. Uh, Leanne, what are the issues related that you experienced in your activity related to these topics? Look, I think the biggest challenge for us has been we're seeking new forms of data. We want to know the origin of where something comes from. We're seeking out at an object level, the greenhouse gas footprint and the carbon footprint of a diamond. So it can be compared against a synthetic or a man-made diamond. And arguably this data had not existed um, or never had it been connected before Everledger became involved in the world. Uh, and so I think uh, blockchain as well provides for, internally in private blockchains, it provided for an interesting set of um, uh, coordinated efforts of data. But when we start serving millions of diamonds out across the world into fast 
um, e-commerce like platforms where um, the driver of the decision of the consumer is to understand more than just the price of the diamond. Um, arguably, the structure of the technology needs to be uh, rethought in terms of speed um, when we think about it from a high threshold of, of, of large of large marketplaces. Um, the problems to be solved in the diamond industry are very, very clear. You know, we have man-made diamonds and, and natural stones now both entering into the market. Um, a, a, a natural eye cannot tell the difference between the two. You would need to be a trained gemologist and or you would need to have some scientific instruments to tell the difference. And consumers are, are nervous about about the, the, the items that they're purchasing. They have a consciousness about their decisions. We have a $4 billion shortfall in the mid-tier of the market um, with financiers pulling back out of the industry. And, of course, there's no ETFs and futures markets yet for diamonds and arguably with... Uh, um, evolution of tokenization and NFTs. We think that that might be a, a future promise, uh, but we've started from the really hard part, and that is bringing together new forms of data to enable not just only the identity of the diamond to be known, but where it is in the world and how that risk is calibrated. Uh, thanks, Liam. You mentioned, you know, diamonds, uh, uh, which is maybe a large part of your activity. What are the most promising you know, fills of uh, actually goods uh, related to the activity that you carry on that are most promising. I guess you don't only trace, I mean, the origin of and the carbon footprint of diamonds. Are there any other uh, areas that you might think critical in your activity? I mean, we just purposed ourselves out to ask a simple question, where does it come from? And diamonds on the back end of Diamonds, of course, was one of the first industries we looked at. But we also know that question is very important for where does it go to after it leaves me? And that's the construct of the circular economy. And when I think about what could potentially be in the next year, 10 years, the most conflicted supply chain in the world, what is potentially the most opaque and where can we prevent another blood diamond like um, Endeavour? And so we began in 2016, a year after Everledger started, and started to look at stored energy, and that's batteries. When we think about the supply chain of lithium and cobalt, we know that electric vehicles is about to explode into the global market with recent decisions, for example, like Boris Johnson in the UK bringing forward a half a decade of commitment to electric vehicles. We know that stored energy is the place for us to be. And so bringing together a battery passport, not only just looking at the supply chain from a perspective of raw materials and critical minerals and metals, but also thinking about it from an afterlife perspective. How do you disassemble? How do you repurpose? And how do you um, bring those two supply chain of use and secondary use markets um, into, a, into an infrastructure? So I'm betting big on batteries. Great. That's... Um you somehow anticipated, you know, my following questions, you know, about circular economy and sustainability. You know, we'll be back on this on these topics at the end of the meeting somehow. Um, coming, I mean, to once again to the more financial aspects of supply chain and supply chain management. Uh, I would love to have a perspective by Christine as well, you know, on what are the challenges that she's facing in, in her activities in blockchain space? Yeah, so very similar to what Andy shared, the, the challenges that most, you know, and I'll speak from a corporate and a bank perspective, is really overcoming that automation capability, right? So really, to use blockchain, you have to digitize and automate your process. To Andy's point, you don't want to automate a bad process, right? So you automate a bad process, you get out of what you put into it, right? So. Um, what we've seen is really transforming that digital, um, that physical asset into a digital asset. Um, we do think traceability is huge um, with blockchain. Um, some of the challenges um, that our customers face are, you know, having that history on the asset. So I'll give you an example. Um, if I go and I want to sell an invoice out, I want to finance it, do an AR finance, so a lot of times the corporates will go and um, you may call it factoring, right? They go out and sell their invoices. The bank wants some certainty around, you know, is this a confirmed payable? You know, is this a new relationship between a buyer and a supplier? 
Um, you know, what's the history on this? Is, is there fraud associated with it, right? Um, and then if that bank or asset manager um, purchases that asset, they may distribute that in a secondary market, right? And that comes with another sense of validation and transparency around the asset. And so you start thinking about data that hops between systems. One of the challenges, the biggest challenges is having that connected data view across. And to me, that's one of the huge benefits. So I'm, I'm much more optimistic about blockchain, especially in the corporate and financial market space. Um, I don't think traditional technology has the capability to provide that traceability across. It's not going to solve everything, but um, the challenges that I think we're going to run into is that interoperability across blockchain. So one of the things I know my company is working on is we have a private blockchain solution, but we're working to integrate with the public blockchain solutions as well to make sure that we have that handshake. Because I do think that that will be the challenge as, as we look forward five, 10 years out from now. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, just coming to the next question, you know, that comes to my mind that I often ask during my uh, activity. Uh, we often hear talking about private blockchain, public blockchain, uh, interacting, of course, between each other. Um, I know it's quite generic, but I would love to have your perspective into this. Uh, is there any possibility for these two things? I mean, we should make it clear whether they could interact and how they could, both of these technologies, impact on the blockchain and supply chain. Yeah, I, I know from my perspective, I think there's a misnomer that a public blockchain solution doesn't come with security, right? And I think a lot of times people don't understand that concept. So I think there has to be interoperability. I think there's a lot of work in working groups globally at trying to drive that, some standardization as well. We're starting to see the emergence of that, right? Um, but I also think that people need to get educated as well that you know public blockchain solutions have privacy associated with them, right? So as you interact and in the future we exchange tokens instead of physical assets with one another, let's say, um, Andy, you send me uh, a, a token of an invoice instead of me actually scanning and ingesting an invoice from a supplier. I mean, that's going to be a game changer in the future, right? And so, um, my, my call to action for others in the space is to make sure that we figure out a way to make sure our solutions all work together, right? You pointed out a very interesting thing, uh, Christine, which is standards. You know, we've been talking within the Hyperledge Trade Financing Group. We've had speakers from international institutions dealing with these, trying to find a smooth, let's say, interaction ground for all these solutions to cooperate, of course. Being trade finance, just the supply chain, uh, let's say, uh, a team game, an interacting game. Uh, I would love to hear, of course, about from Andy, what is his opinion and Leanne as well in this respect. I mean, both in, in terms of public blockchain and private blockchain and interoperability, Let's try to define this kind of magic word as much as we can. Sure, sure, sure. So I, I, I think, I think uh, maybe a, a, a brief uh, uh, add-on, you know. I think, uh, you know, in, in a public blockchain, uh, you know, everyone will say that, oh, anyone can read and write on the ledger, you know. But a public blockchain that is established is huge. Uh, in order for someone to really make changes to it, you know, re-authenticate, you know, so forth and so on. It takes a long time, you know, and, and that, that kind of uh, layer would actually add on a lot more security, you know, to, 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 the, to the whole aspects of, uh, you know, of a public uh, blockchain. But, but if you look at a, a private blockchain, it could be maybe a single organization can read and write uh, more so and only a handful of nodes can write on the ledger. So in some cases, you know, they can, delete a block as and when they want, right? So it depends on the needs of uh, and the context that we are talking about, you know, when we, when we bring out the topic public or private, you know, 
um, so different people would have their own different opinion. You know what what should be good and what should not be good. But I I, I think I think in general, you know, uh, you know, in two zero two one, you know, public private blockchain is is no longer the, the the main buzzword. You know, I think we should look at things like a multi chain aspects. You know, a multi protocol aspects of things. Because right now, you know, let, let's be really realistic about it. Not everyone is on Hyperledger, right? Not everyone is on Ethereum, you know, because of the gas fees and so forth. There will be a time, and right now is really happening again, where different organizations are using different blockchain, and they want each other to be able to read, reach each other to be able to interact. So I think multi-chain uh, protocol would be something that is more exciting, you know, to talk about, you know, in my opinion. And that is also a, a, a better environment for everyone to integrate together. You know, that, that's my two cents worth. Yeah, look, if you've got a global footprint like we do and five and a half years in the making with maturity and there's about 35% of the global trade of emeralds that are on our platform as a prime example. You know, the architecture of our platform sits in both on-chain and off-chain data stores as well as um, public and private. Um, so I think it's an and uh, statement rather than an or statement when you think about the deployment of true enterprise architecture like, like we're discussing today. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm... Andy mentioned something about layers. I mean, and this is something that I've always thought about, you know, uh, think of as blockchain in layers and each layer is carrying out a specific duty uh, and each of them should cooperate for a global picture. Uh, Andy, uh, we're talking about blockchain, blockchain. How do you see the interaction with other technologies does blockchain allow for this? Uh, I mean, what, where are we now in terms of interaction with other types of technology, namely, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, which in my opinion will have a deep impact in, in supply chain as well? Yeah, I, I think definitely. I think when we talk about IoT, AI, big data and so forth, they, they are part of the whole technology offering that we have, you know, right now. And, and blockchain is just another technology uh, uh, offering that's on the table right now. Uh, it, you can see blockchain as an added, uh, or maybe an enhanced security layer, you know, over all these other devices that, that, that you talk about or all these other technology that you talk about. You know, I, I, give, I give advice to uh, governments, as you, as you know. So some of them, you know, they, they, they are... They, they have created their smart city, you know, and the idea of adding blockchain onto the smart city uh, is, 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 one, is one way, is, is a way to, to securitize, uh, I mean, increase security, you know, for, for the whole smart city. So, um, so again, you know, I, I, I think blockchain has a, has a space, you know, has a, has, a, has a good position, but they have to really... Uh, work together with the rest of the technology in order to optimize the true value of, uh, of, of blockchain. Thank you. Yeah, I can speak to, I mean, working in the diamond and gemstone industry, we have things like resonant ultrasound, which is the sound wave technology. It's been quite, uh, it's an old technology, been around for quite some time, but it never necessarily been applied uh, within the diamond and gemstone industry before. Hyperspectral and multispectral cameras to be able to identify um, an item, uh, pretty much an anti-counterfeit measure. I mean, a lot of those technologies run um, uh, in coordination with blockchain to help to provide that forensic identity view, as I said before. And diamonds go through machines and those machines are connected. Uh, and so we have to enable that IoT connection. Um, so it's not necessarily about someone sitting on a keyboard and entering in the information. It's actually the connectedness of um, laser cutting machines, uh, connectedness of the scanning machines. Um, this is all a part of the network as it starts to evolve and explode globally. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, there is another thing I want to ask you all, each of you. Uh, we were talking about digitization, tokenization, 
I would love to have from each of you, I mean, uh, a picture of the projects that are ongoing, being, uh, you know, using this tokenization and digitization processes. What are the most important use cases, I mean, within the uh, supply chain management? Maybe from, from my perspective, um, working closely in the financial services space, um, the biggest kind of solutions that um, I've seen out there are use cases are digitizing the working capital process. So you're talking inventory, purchase order, invoices, all the way to the cash being received in a bank account, right? So digitizing that, automating it, and providing traceability across and then the ability to provide traceability out um, when you finance those assets. So a lot of times you have corporates that are offering um, something like a supply chain finance program for their suppliers, right? They're using their credit rating to offer a financing program to facilitate the funding of their supply chain, right? Because if they don't have certain suppliers, they don't have their supply chain, which means they can't actually sell their products. And so, um, you know, why is why is blockchain important in that space? Because blockchain gives the traceability of those assets into that financial market and that instrument and provides a digitization and automation. Um, very similar to what Andy and Leanne said too, just to add, you know, we see um, this kind of practical use, use case in the financial services space complemented with machine learning, AI, right? traditional you know scanning of invoices used to be done with ocr technology now we're able to leverage machine learning and ai to do pattern recognition on documentation right it's kind of the land of opportunity to really digitize and automate all that rich data that sits across that financial services use case can be used as insights back to the supply chain to help them run their processes better as well so that's just kind of what i see from the banking and corporate space Thank you, Christine. This is an argument that I pretty much like, you know, being involved in trade finance, I have a clear picture of what is called as a gap, which is quite a huge one, especially for the micro, small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of uh, European economy, and in particular, the country where I live, you know, where this gap is even more evident. Um, Andy, any thoughts about these? Any idea to give us? I, I think um, I think for this uh, blockchain technology again, I think um, I, I see the impact a lot bigger in uh, places where we talk about industrial 4.0 automation. You know, um, uh, Christine mentioned about uh, automation as well. Uh, on, on, on the finance side of things, but I, I look at it from a more manufacturing standpoint, you know, um, I, I do see that uh, some of the, uh, uh, my, my partners in Germany are really putting up uh, solutions, you know, uh, blockchain solutions on top of their, 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 uh, this uh, whole industrial 4.0 setup that is in Germany. I, I think that that is one, one, one exciting thing that is that, that I see. You know, other than that, I, I think uh, the actual usability of supply chain, uh, blockchain uh, on, a, on a rewards uh, loyalty platforms are also fairly interesting, you know, because um, right now, you know, whenever we talk about supply chain, it could be just a B2B kind of a setup, you know, but with the, with the rewards uh, 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 embedded into, into the whole supply chain, for example, um, that can induce a lot more participation from consumer and that can also help the whole traceability process a, a bit more wholesome, you know, instead of just, you know, tracking it from, from factory A to, to, to retail store uh, A, you know, then, then that's it, you know. So I, I think, again, you know, that's how blockchain can, uh, can value you know, to that, to that, to that uh, current uh, situation right now. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much. Leanne, any thoughts about this? I mean, tokenization, digitization, from your perspective, of course. 
Yeah, look, there's three probably um, very important use cases that we've implemented. One is around fractional ownership, bringing liquidity to the diamond industry. Um, and some of that is playing out um, in so much that it was a project we began in 2016 with the Singapore Diamond Investment Exchange. So how do you take you know, a basket of diamonds to enable it to be fungible because diamonds are non-fungible in their own right? Um, and three carat diamond as a prime example to be an investable vehicle. You can have fractional ownership. The second is the implementation of some work we did with MCQ or Alexander McQueen um, from a perspective of designers. So typically in those very large fashion houses, it's one key designer, but these guys released icons each month and those icons relate to pop culture. So let's say Banksy. Um, in the UK and they have a very different designer to someone in say Korea who has a fanatical um, following around karaoke um, and so to tokenize the process of the supply chain but also the element of design and then enable the fractional royalties to be paid back over time um, is also interesting but putting an NFC tag on the outside of a garment to enable you to tap it it can become the invitation into a VIP event which is really um, the sort of what's happening now is about 300,000 garments on chain, commitment to over a million garments by the end of the year in manufacturing, all of which is around that high end fashion um, uh, tokenization. But the third, which is I think the most important, is the digital derivative of supply chain when it comes to what we call the pre competitive space of climate and environment. And if you can tokenize a supply chain and the footprint around water, sustainability, carbon, um, you have the ability now to finally answer the scope three. So greenhouse emissions on scope one, which is really looking at an internal vertical supply chain, but scope three is one of the grander challenges. And um, that's the place that we're most passionate about is how can we can bring scope three traceability and responsibility into, into supply chains. And we think that tokenization and NFTs play a pretty important role there. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, that, that's that's the hook main for, for for one of the last questions that I wanted to ask you all. Uh, one buzzword, the current buzzword, is green finance, green supply chain. Everything's going green, and I wanted to have your perspective into this. Just an idea on how, first of all blockchain can step in to uh, to achieve this this green supply chain green trade green trade finance what how do you envisage the role of blockchain within the space how can it help achieving this well first i think we've got Sort out our public blockchains first. I mean, let's be honest, the way upon which a lot of that um, is currently constructed is a concern. But in our environment, in private chains, um, it's about the readiness of a data that doesn't necessarily exist or hasn't been thought about as a critical capture point at every point in the measuring cycle or in the production cycle. Um, you know, parts of this data um, is being captured, however, via different means or different parts of the supply chain. So um, how do we get it down to an object level is actually probably a bit of the challenge. Um, for example, I can get an electricity bill, an invoice and scan that and maybe amortise it out over the entire production scheme. But ultimately, we need to get more granular in being able to sort of capture this information. There are a number of factories in the diamond industry that have become what we call LED certified, which enables the capturing of carbon over the top of the cutting desks. Um, we can capture the amount of water that's being used, um, solar on the roof of the building itself, and, and we can get it down to an object level, but not all industries are going to be like that. So um, there's a lot of work to be done. We do have 19 goals um, for the SDGs and um, uh, but there's no data models that sit beneath each of the SDGs. So how do we actually think about um, bringing together those, uh, the, the data models that will support sustainability? That's still a very large piece of work to be done. Thank you so much, Leanne. Andy, any thoughts about this? I mean, 
I I look I look at it from um from from uh, this uh, supply chain traceability angle. You know, by using uh, blockchain technology, companies are, are able to record the uh, journeys and the, uh, the 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 whole product life cycle. You know, uh, more accurately and and even cheaply. You know, for some. So with suppliers, they are invited into this uh, this closed network. Every time a product changes hands within the supply chain, you can know the location, the timestamp. And, and thus creating a new block. I think having all these things in the traceable, in, in the traceable format will help uh, uh, sustainable matters, you know, a, a lot more than just manually tracing it and manually talking about it. But, um, but, 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 the, but the true fact is um, far and few companies are actually using blockchain technology as a form of a, uh, a sustainable program, you know, because Right now, if you again look, look at look at the, 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 the actual utilization of, of a blockchain uh, on, on these big companies is, is very low. You know, you, you, may, you may hear about uh, Walmart, you know, adopting blockchain within its live food business, for example. You know, they, they are able to reduce the, 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 the tracking from uh, maybe a few days to a few seconds, for example. You know, all these are good, nice examples to have, but the actual usage, you know, uh, among other players, I think is, is very low, very, very low. So I, I, I still go back to the point where we have to keep things simple for the time being. Just look at traceability, you know, by, by having the concept of know, knowing the whole journey of the products, you are already contributing a, a fair bit to the whole sustainable, sustainable environment that, 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 that we, are trying to, we are trying to make. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Christine, uh, I would love to have your perspective on the financial side about this to some kind of closed loop. Yes, so um, we see a lot of interest from financial institutions on helping fund, you know, ESG programs, right? Um, we see the same on um, buyers wanting to sponsor their suppliers and give them credits um, if they've proven, you know, certain footprints and whatnot. And so um, from my perspective, um, the ability, you know, very similar to what the other panelists stated, um, the ability to have traceability around the asset is huge. Um, the piece that's missing right now is that measurement component, those services to actually give that measurement of sustainability. Um, but the market is there, right? The opportunities there, especially in the financial services space, to offer funding differently, right? Um, to offer discounts, to really incentivize a supply chain to behave a certain way. Um, even investment in, um, you know, go outside of the green initiative and, and think about my own minority-owned businesses, right? Women-led businesses. Um, so there's there's an, a huge opportunity to originate what I call these assets in the financial uh, space. Uh, now it's about, about using something like blockchain to actually trace that and provide that transparency across. Thank you so much, Christine. You touched a very sensitive point. I mean, talking about ESG, which was of course uh, one of the main interests. Um, time is running out, you know, we, we coming close to the end of this meeting and I would love to go through some questions that I see uh, and I would love to start from this one. There was one, uh, maybe this is for Leanne. In the diamond example, or even in the case of any other products, traceability and transparency of the product journey and related data that could speak of its quality could be valuable to consumers. But would the manufacturers, sellers, dealers, agents be as willing to have that level of traceability published? What sort of data in the process would they want to keep private or hidden? Yeah, so I think um, this is pretty much where the power of smart contracts come into play and how you would do a data incentivization model across a complex supply chain. Um, pricing is certainly very sensitive, um, so I think that's actually something that is often kept, particularly in 
the first part of the supply chain from extraction through to manufacturing. But we often find that the attributes of the product, the safety leveling of the product, the provenance story of the product um, is typically public through the entirety of the chain itself. Um, some of the things that have been a bit light and day in terms of where people want full tracity and transparency is in the certification backbone. Um, and so are you certified based on Responsible Jewellery Council as a prime example? Do they want that to be seen uh, publicly or would they like that only under query? Uh, and, but then again, it's actually the way upon which the chain has been configured uh, and we have enabled that through smart contracts so that each of the participants becomes a request of a pool of information rather than just assuming everything is public or everything is private. Perfect. I would also would love to have Andy's perspective into this, how do you see it? We've been talking about somehow interoperability and private and, and public blockchain. And what's your opinion to this? Um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's the same, same theory that I've applied. You know, whether it's public or private, it depends on, on what actual needs that you have, right? If you are, if you are like, uh, you know, maybe uh, a lien or, 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 or into diamonds and so forth, you might have both. You know, but if you are a smaller enterprise and you want to keep things simple, you know, you, you can just just keep yourself in a private blockchain, right? Um, so that's how I see it. Okay. Uh, this is another question, you know, it's about a project called VeChain Thor project. Uh, is the tool popular in supply chain management? I admit this is the very first time I hear about this. I, th I think um, V Chain Talk. I, th I think they are they are the leader right now for supply chain blockchain solution. You know, I think they did uh, work for MNCs and so forth. But I, I saw the question: Is it popular tool in the supply chain management process? I think the answer is no. No, hundred percent not. Uh, I, I think they need. To, I think they, they have a good product. Leading. Sorry. Andy, I think Everledge is leading in supply chain management. <laughs> mm, not, 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 not really. It really depends on where, where you are from and, and what, what you are really looking at it. In, in, the, in the actual fact, just to be real honest to everybody, none, none of all these all this, uh, protocol projects are, are really very popular. You know, maybe popular in the speculative world, but adoption world, I don't think so. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, there is one last question. Um, it is for Leanne, basically, and Christine. What are your thoughts on the concept of post-quantum resilience in the context of the architecture of supply chain system development? I can take that if you want. Or do you, you go for it, Christine? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, look, um, we're excited because diamonds are helping to uh, accelerate quantum resilience. So from a diamond perspective, we think that it's a pretty transformative technology. From a perspective of the architecture of physical supply chains, it just doesn't necessarily um, play a role. Uh, with the exception of, um, uh, mater you know, material advancements, for example, we are starting to see post-quantum resilience um, and some of those technologies coming into the production of synthetic materials like synthetic diamonds. Um, but ultimately, there's also a large question that's still at play. And that is, if quantum computing does become the next um, evolution in terms of high resiliency computing, then what will that do to the underlying cryptographic sequencing that we rely upon now for the security of public and private blockchains? And so that's a forever question that many people are asking themselves. Um, and it is accelerating quite rapidly with the outputs from IBM and even Google now moving into a very much a post beta stage. So we're starting to see quantum positioning um, becoming embedded within large hosting environments, but I would say there are a few industries that are likely to benefit from this um, well ahead of um, supply chains, like cybersecurity is a prime example, finance, um, healthcare, 
Um, even um, artificial intelligence is really going to be the one that's going to rise really quickly out of simulated complex modelling on post-quantum. I'm not sure that supply chains is going to be the first winner out of it. Logistics, but it would have to link directly back into the 5G network. Um, and again, um, that's also something that is yet to be seen uh, globally adopted. Thank you, Leanne. That's very interesting what you mentioned. I mean, it's, uh, it's one of the battles, professionally speaking, you know, trying to come up with an integrated project, not involving just a single uh, branch, but coming more and more to cooperate it all together. Christine, you wanted to add something to what Leanne mentioned? Yeah, I would just agree. Um, you know, I, I think very similar. I think, you know, it's supply chain will probably be the last place that that hits, right? Um, I do agree uh, spending a lot of time on payments and fraud. I think the cybersecurity space is more relevant. Um, so I definitely agree with what she said. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Andy, would you love to add anything to, to this last discussion? Um, no. Okay. I mean, for me, it was, uh, I will leave it on to the audience, I mean, to, to, to leave more questioning to what we have just discussed. Hi, um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, thank you, the speaker, for the awesome discussion. Uh, we, I, we just posted the discussion at the site discussion breakout room in a chat box. Feel free to uh, jump in the breakout room and continue this discussion with the awesome speakers. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Bye. Bye, goodbye to all the speakers and thank you so much. Bye, Andy. Bye, Christine. Bye, Leanne.